Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the best game Cox podcast on the internet. Today is Tuesday, November the 16th, 2021. Today's show, former fame, blah, 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 former fame pops. <clears throat> My check one, two, one, two, three, four. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the best game Cox podcast on the internet. Today is Tuesday, November the 16th, 2021. On today's show, former game Cox football player Alex McGrath joins me does each and every single Tuesday to help break down just what went wrong in Como, South Carolina Falls to the Missouri Tigers by a score of 31 to 28. We also look ahead to this weekend's matchup under the lights at Williams Bryce. As Mike Bobo returns to Columbia South Carolina, as the Gamecocks take on the Auburn Tigers in a big SEC showdown. Guys, all that and more here on a Tuesday. It's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service. They bring care and attention on the companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service is what separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company. They're a moving services company. And they're also employee-owned co-op. The movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is invested in your success. They have dedicated professional crew members, and they also offer black glove service. They offer end-to-end packing services, custom creating and packaging special items, and cleaning services as well. They're founded by Greenville Natives and University of South Carolina alumni guys, so a Gamecock owned small business. They also offer 20 years of project management moving experience, and they can offer logistics and solutions that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for. Guys, whether in the upstate or across the state of South Carolina, if you have any moving needs this holiday season, be sure to check out our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. You can find them on social media, at Upstate Movers Group. Of course, if you have any other questions, go to their website, upstatemoversgroup.com that's upstatemoversgroup.com be sure to check them out and tell them chris from the spurs up show sent you let's get it Guys, joining he does each and every single Tuesday, former Gamecocks football player Alex McGrath. Alex going to help me break down just what happened over the weekend as South Carolina falls to five and five overall in the 2021 football season to the hands of the Missouri Tigers by a final score of 31 to 28. We're also going to look ahead to this weekend upcoming as the final SEC matchup of the 2021 season will take place as South Carolina welcomes the Auburn Tigers to Williams Bryce. Stadium, guys, a lot to get into here on a Tuesday. Before we do, they, though, first things first, Alex, again, appreciate you as always taking the time. How was your weekend, my friend, outside of the obvious three- or four-hour window on Saturday afternoon? It was a good weekend, man. It was a good weekend. Just I did a, I did a good bit of uh, yard work this weekend, blowing some leaves in the backyard, which, you know, I finish, and then two hours later, the backyard's covered in leaves again, so it's just an utterly depressing activity. Not unlike what we saw Saturday afternoon. So, you know, all in all, all in all, solid weekend. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say, I don't know about your way, but I know in Fort Will, Fort Mill, I should say, beautiful weather weekend this weekend. So at least we had oh, yeah. that. It was, it was much warmer than it was in uh, in Columbia, Missouri, for sure. Without further ado, Alex, let's just go ahead and dive into that game because I, I want to give you this funny side note, this funny tidbit, if you will. Um, I, you know, I was pretty, and I feel like we all were, you know, we were riding high last week after the Florida game and I was optimistic and felt good about the Gamecocks chances at getting their sixth win and, and beating a Missouri team. And I think even you and I can sit here on this Tuesday and both agree. Missouri's not a great football team a- a- at all. Not yeah. at all. They, they are not a very good team. And I think we had a lot of confidence, of course, riding into that game, but about 10 minutes before kickoff, I looked around to those who were around me and, and just said, Hey, I'm optimistic. I picked South Carolina to win, obviously. I feel really good, but nothing will surprise me. Nothing will surprise me. And, and I feel like, and I know you have a different vantage point because you're a former South Carolina football player. You've been in the locker room. You've been on the field. But I jokingly, half-jokingly, I should say, have said all week that all my real Gamecock fans, people have, who have watched South Carolina football over an extended period of time, almost saw this one coming 
And if you didn't see it coming, you at least knew it was a possibility. And again, we were just joking off air. Hey, I'm not surprised. And you mentioned, unfortunately, I'm not. You know, again, so I sit here again this week, early this week, not nearly as upset, frustrated, disgruntled as you would expect after such a disappointing loss. I'm kind of like Alex, you know, when you do something wrong when you were younger, right? And your dad, you'd have to face dad, right? And, and, and your dad would say, son, I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I'm just disappointed. That, that's how I feel right now. That's how I feel. I'm just disappointed because I'm not shocked. We've seen this movie before. I'm just disappointed, I guess, that you could not capitalize off of all those good vibes and all that momentum you had last week. You, you just couldn't capitalize and do anything with it and get that sixth win. No, and it, you know, it was really, you kind of look at the Florida game and, you know, we broke a lot of tendencies in that game, right? So we didn't have any penalties to speak of. We didn't have any turnovers. And it's like you get into Missouri and all those things rear their ugly head. And even despite that, you've got a chance to win the game late in the game. And, you know, I think, I think that's progress on some level. I mean, it's frustrating to watch because, you know, you're getting ready to, you know, potentially go up two touchdowns there in the first quarter and you fumble a quarterback running back exchange in the backfield. And then you kind of lose control over the next couple of periods there only to get it back late in the fourth. And, and, you know, again, go down the field, you give yourself a chance. You're down three, there's four and a half minutes left. You got two timeouts. You've got every chance in the world to like tie this up or close it out. And you just don't get done because, you know, defense just came up empty there so you know it's disappointing to watch but I don't know that it was necessarily the typical lay an egg game I think you know more than anything else we just kind of reverted to our mean Hmm. you know Florida was the you know Florida was you know this end of the bell curve Vanderbilt was this end of the bell curve you know everything else we've seen from the Gamecocks this year is kind of right in that middle like you give yourself a chance you know not unlike we played against Kentucky like you give yourself a chance to win that game you just don't come through with it, whether that's due to penalties. I mean, I think in this case, what we saw this weekend was purely due to turnovers. You know, our defense still generated a good number of turnovers for us, but at the same time, like, we're turning the ball over in bad spots at the worst possible times, and this is what you get. Yeah, and I said it after the game, Alex, the Gamecocks just are who we thought they were. Because I think that was the question going into the game all last week was, you know, which South Carolina team will show up. I think just South Carolina showed up. And I agree with you. I don't think this team, you know, it's it's easy. It's the lazy take, in my opinion, to say, well, they got full of themselves and read their press, press clippings and they were overconfident. I don't know that was really the case. I just think you just got beat. And like you said, you reverted back to a lot of the things you did prior to the Florida game. And, of course, now, you know, I, I think – Certainly, as we got closer to kickoff on Saturday, when you were looking at that Florida score, keeping one eye on it and saying, well, Samford scored 42 points and a half. So maybe, you know, maybe we put, we shouldn't put quite as much stock in that one as we did. Maybe, maybe not. Perhaps, uh, perhaps not. That's a fascinating case study we can yeah. get into down the line. But right. That's neither here nor there. If only the transitive property worked like that in college football. But no, I mean, I think it was a game where, again, you, you've sort of been – the same team all year. I don't think you've regressed, like, as a very popular take. And it's, oh, it's so easy. Oh, we've regressed. We've gotten worse. Have you, though? I mean, really? Have you? No, and there, there are things so that – there are things that have been sort of maddening that I'm going to get into in just a second, things that have been disappointing and make you want to pull your hair out at times. But I think the Gamecocks just sort of, Alex, they are who they are. And, and, and I'll say this, too. I say that and also saying this, and I don't want to jump too far ahead. That same exact reason, though, you can see things both glass half full, glass half empty. Because the same reason why many fans are back on the side of, well, we're not going to win another game, we're going to get blown out. It's the same exact reason why Sal kind of might do something stupid and win them both. Is because yeah. it, you just, it, to read this team, and it's like you mentioned the bell curve. Which, will the pendulum swing, will the Gamecocks be closer to one side and the other? And if they are, who knows? And it also helps you're playing two very imperfect teams in the season. But that's neither here nor there. Again, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more and just a little bit later. But, you know, the Gamecocks just are who we are, in my opinion, Alex. I don't think they've gotten worse. I don't know they've gotten much better, which I think it's kind of hard to get better when you're on your third quarterback and your offensive line just purely as bad as they've been. 
But this team is who it is, and that's okay. You're not one and nine. You're five and five, but you are who you are. Yeah, I, like I would almost argue that I like this game versus the others. Like I think you've seen noticeable improvement. Um, you know, like we, like we had every chance to really win that game and you know, both win that game and run away with it. And I think you just had some failings on the offensive and defensive side of the ball at really the worst times. And it's just those missed time turnovers. Like, you know, if that fumble six doesn't exist, you know, where does that leave us? You know, and so you kind of look at that stuff. So I think, like, if you look at this game in a microcosm and you compare it to what we saw against Troy, what we saw against Vanderbilt, what we saw against ECU, I think this team is better at this point in the season than those teams were playing those opponents. So I think there is improvement on that front. It was just, you know, it, like looking at it next to the Florida game, I understand where that opinion would come from. But, you know, at the same time, like looking back at it, going further back and forward game, saying, look at this against Vanderbilt, look at this against Troy, look at this against ECU. Like, I think this is a better team that was out there at that point. Well, of course, Alex, you know, sitting here on a Tuesday, as is normal after you lose a game, the Gamecocks fan base is reacting rationally. Just fire everyone, especially Marcus Satterfield, who's mm-hmm. <laughs> who finds himself back on the hot seat this week after you rushed for a measly 1.6 yards per carry against basically the worst rush defense in all of college football. I, I feel like what we should have had this season, Alex, I think we kind of missed the, the opportunity here, is to have like a week-to-week Alex McGrath like temperature check on on Marcus Satterfield, where you just kind of stand here like this and say, like, "How do you feel about Satterfield?" And your thumb just kind of teeters between here and there, and then you find you give your verdict up or down. But no, seriously, I mean, you look at that game. People are going to look back to play calling, and you know, I, I said this on social media and going to the quarterback position, offense as a whole, but quarterback position. And I made this claim, and I think those, and I'm sure you'll understand this. Those who can think critically understand what I was saying. I said that this game shows Jason Brown wasn't the savior against Florida. The reason you won that ball game, the offensive line just finally showed up and blocked someone. And of course, talking about reverting to old ways, the O line did nothing, looked abysmal, looked pitiful. You mentioned Jason Brown had negative 50 rushing yards to his credit. Um, but when it comes to play calling, and you mentioned the one where you had the fumble that was a touchdown, I know many people have critiqued that play action call, or I think that was supposed to be like a play action screen or whatever it was. Um, my only gripe, really, I, I thought in the second half, you sort of abandoned the run, which I, I just, I know it didn't work in the first half, obviously, because you had Alex, I don't know if you knew this, 0.6 yards per carry at halftime, which is which is mind-blowing in its own right. But did you have issues? I mean, do, do you look at this team through 10 weeks? Do you look at this team? Do you look at the game on Saturday and say, it was on play calling? Is it a mix of things? Like the overall temperature check with Marcus Satterford, because we are going to get to a point in a couple of weeks where the season's going to be over, and Shane Beamer's going to have some decisions to make when it comes to his offensive staff, his staff as a whole. Any any thoughts from you, anything that stands out from the offensive game plan, execution, play calling, Satterfield, all those things as a whole? I mean, to me, like casually observing it, it appeared as execution woes more than play calling woes. I mean, a perfect example – that, you know, first interception that we threw, like, you know, if he throws that out ahead of Dak Joyner, I mean, he's open and you just underthrow it. Like the one in the second half where we got absolutely gifted a holding call on what should have been another pick, you know, it's it's the same thing. That guy's open if you throw it out there to him. And so I, I keep seeing Well, you, you mentioned you mentioned the fumble fumbled exchange early in the game. That that's right. That's that's not play calling, man. That is just two guys that that's aren't on not, the same page and fumble the football. Right, exactly. And so I like while in my disappointed in what our offense has looked like in 2021, I mean, absolutely, yes. I was hoping, you know, you'd get something more explosive than that. At the same time, I kind of reflect on it and say, hey we had a graduate assistant starting for two weeks. We had a guy playing on ostensibly what was a broken foot. And now we've got a division, you know, an FCS transfer manning this for us. And not to say that he can't do it, but like, I don't know that you're getting a full look at the compliments of what this offense could be. And it's, it's tough for me to make that call because when I see those plays, 
where you you get turnovers on those things that you, you've got somebody open, like that scheme worked. It's just, you didn't execute it. And it goes back to, the, it's the same thing with offensive line. Like, is it overly complicated? I mean, probably. Do we need to back that up? Probably. But, you know, if you're not executing it, like, you know, you could have Aaron Rodgers standing back there. And if you're not blocking anybody, he can't do anything. And so you kind of take those facets into, into play. And does that fall on the offensive coordinator? You know, maybe that's the conclusion that everybody comes to, but I'm not there. Yeah. I mean, I made the I made the joke, and I actually think realistically, the only quarterback that could have success behind this offensive line right now is probably Michael Vick. So I mean, I mean, just yeah. about just, Lamar just about. Jackson, somebody right? Maybe thing. a Lamar, yeah. maybe a Lamar Jackson, but uh, you know, it, yeah. Again, it's it's hard to pin it all on play calling when you're running for your life and you can't run the football. And, and speaking of that, again, Alex, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to give me you know a, a great answer because I think it's just so maddening and it, it just doesn't make any sense. The run game. How do you go from rushing for 284 yards against Florida to I let me let me look at the total. The total against Mizzou was a grand total of 57. How does that happen? Because as much disarray as Florida is in, they have better players on the defensive line and on the defense as a whole than Mizzou does. I mean, literally again, 129th out of 130th. Can't get much worse than Missouri is on the defensive side. And Shane Beamer and everybody else can say. Well, they've made improvements. They've made strides. Look at the Georgia film. You're going to have a hard time selling me that Mizzou has just made that many improvements to hold you to 57 rushing yards. I mean, anything you – I mean, is there anything you've seen? I, again, I, I don't know oh, yeah. no, if I've you got, can make I've it make sense. For you. Oh, I can make it make sense for you. <laughs> Fair enough. We've played please, 10 please, games. please we've played, do. We've played 10 games, right? We have rushed poorly in nine of them. The outlier is a Florida team that has, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> done something very similar to what I think the team did last year and just quit. Where they're not I, – I, Kirk Herbstreit actually said a great on game day where, you know, you've kind of hit this inflection point. I don't know what happened in that locker room, but – you know, those guys are not playing as a team anymore, or at least it doesn't look like it on paper. So, you know, I think if you take that outlier into context, I think that being the outlier, you've done, you, we've run the ball the exact same way with the same looks, with the same people in there as we have the other nine weeks of the season. So I think that was more expected than what happened against Florida. Like, I don't think there was a secret sauce that we put into place against Florida. I just think the will to get that done from their defense was not there. And that's why we had success. So is I there, mean, hell, Sam, Sanford put up what's almost 60 on them. So right. is there any way I just, is there any way to replicate that offensive success on the ground in the last two weeks? Like should, should we be preaching physicality just in the building for the next two weeks? I mean, which I'm sure they already do, but I mean, outside of, again, you are who you are. The Gamecocks are who we thought they are or who I thought they were. But I got to believe you're better than 57 yards on the ground against really anybody, you know? Well, I mean, I think that – I mean, I think I think if you look at somebody like Zaquandre White, who had a heck of a game. Who like, I think – I think we should – I think we should start talking about is he the best running back on the roster right now. I don't care. I, I, I don't care what Kevin Harris did last year. I don't care how many stars Marshawn Lloyd had or Juju McDowell. You know, again, you played with him. I, I'm very hesitant to compare him to this guy because he's an all-time legend. That is Corey Boyd. Like the way Quan White runs the ball with a nastiness and a bad attitude, that's how he plays. And I mean, he sets the tone when he takes the rock. So I mean, I'm all for it, man. I think the guy needs to get some more looks. Totally agree, and I think what you saw Saturday kind of supports the conclusion that the running back by committee needs to be over for the next two weeks. I think you go with Zaquan Ray White in there, and then you rotate the other two in when he gets tired or needs a break or something of that nature. And I think having that consistency at that position, I think, will help the offensive line on at least on some level. And then I think, you know, for the O-line, I think it's just – you know, it's surely they're preaching toughness in there, and you would certainly hat, hope that. so. You would certainly <laughs> hope so. <laughs> one, one, one would imagine. Um, but you know, I think it's really just if you can stay with the consistency 
there. I think he gives you a lot more options and passing out of the backfield too. And so I would go that direction with it. I think yeah, that's had, had, a, had a receiving touchdown as well. Had a receiving touchdown, two catches for 42 yards. So certainly can catch out of the backfield, can tote the rock. We all know. Uh, really quickly before we get off offense, Alex, we've got to talk quarterback play. Any, any, anything, any takeaways, main things from Jason Brown? I mean, I, I thought he played fine. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of last week and it was, it was, it was, it was very fun to, you know, tip the cap and give credit where credit was due and the apology letter to Jason Brown and everything. And, and I still think he played fine on Saturday. Some of those throws very questionable. He was running for his life. I think we both talked off air before the show, the, the one spin move that he has in his arsenal. I understand it worked against Florida, but other teams watch film. So when he does that, they're, they're going to be there waiting for him. I think they're going to, they're going to game plan for that. But, uh, you know, I thought he had a beautiful touchdown pass to Josh Van on the run. I, I still, I, I'm sure you'd agree. I, I still believe that with the escapability and mobility and able to throw on the run, what he provides in that facet of the game, he's still by far the Gamecocks best option the rest of the season, these last two games. Your overall thoughts on the quarterback play from, uh, from Brown on Saturday night. I wasn't thrilled with it. Uh, and again, I think that just has to do with your put, like there was too many instances where you're putting the ball in harm's way. Right. You know, there's four turnovers from that position in one game is going to be unbelievably difficult for any. Team Impossible to for this team to overcome. Impossible. Correct. Yeah. So it's, if you, it's managing those risk reward opportunities, I think just needs to be at the forefront of all the discussions this week. Like if, if you've got somebody in a one-on-one situation and you're scrambling for your life, like don't just chuck it up. Like we've got to be able to, if, if you punt, so be it. Don't, don't give field position away. And I think that just needs to be, first and foremost in the discussion room this week. And you do make a great point, Alex, something I didn't think about because that, that, that is a very good point is that all four of those turnovers, you could directly tie back to that position. Again, not trying to, you know, no, I'm not, I'm rain not down to on Jason, on Renner, but, yeah. but that's a point. That's a good point though. I and mean, again, that, that's a very good point. Like, you know, even when you, the, the play into the goal line where he hits and fumbles, you got to hold on that ball, man. Just find a way to hold on to it. Like that, that's got to be, you know, if nothing else, the result of that play cannot be a turnover. You know what I mean? Fumbly in exchange, like you said, and then two picks. I mean, that's you make a great point. So I think moving forward, you know, the, the, the key going into both those games, the final two, is your quarterback can't turn the football over. It just, it just can't. And I, you know, people want to have their opinions on the quarterback position. That's totally fine, but that's not something Luke Doty did. He didn't turn the ball over like that, at least at that rate, most of the time. So you got to take care of it. You got to take care of it, no doubt. No, that's it's tough. And I mean, and of course, you know, you had that other pick that we were gifted with the holding call to, and it's just like that kind of stuff. You, it's incredible. Even for good teams, that's really hard to get past if you turn the ball over four times in a game. For us, it's a, you know, it's a death sentence. So we just can't put ourselves in that position. And whether that means playing less aggressively or what we, whatever we have to do on that front, I think it's just something that needs to be addressed this week and again i'm not trying to like rein him in and be like no don't try to go make these plays but let's be smart about it like kind of know what the know where we are in the game know where the momentum is know like who you've got out there what throw you're trying to make before you just go and heave it yeah absolutely because you you look early game and that, that fumble on the exchange and I, I fully believe man if you know hindsight's 2020 but I, I think we both probably would agree i mean you you go down there and at least get a field goal that's that the outcome of that game might is probably different. It's probably different because you had Mizzou reeling early and that that fumble just gave them new life. And you know, it goes from being 10 nothing or 14 nothing to seven to seven all of a sudden anybody's game. So yeah, I think that was a huge impact play. So, like you said, again, you know, protecting the football at all costs and not making those not just mistakes, but those timely mistakes that allow your opponent back in it definitely key. On the other side of the ball, Alex, I, I do want to touch on the defense because you know, I, I feel like folks. I feel like folks have danced around this because the defense has been so improved, right? So it's like, well, I'm not going to put it on the defense. I, the team lost this game Saturday. Okay, let, let's just make that clear. The team lost. Not the offense, not just the defense, the team. But that means the defense had a play in it as well. You give up 258 yards on the ground, 5.6 yards per carry. I mean, call it for what it is. Tyler Beatty's an animal. Runs for over 200 on you. But we've been talking about Greg Atkins 
and he needs to go. The offensive line has been abysmal. Should we start putting more blame on Jimmy Lindsey and the defensive line for not being able to stop the run? I get how often they're out there, but hey, I guess if you want to not be out there as long, don't let your opponent go seven for 14 on third down. I mean, again, I, again, I'm not trying to like rain all the blame and put all the blame on the defense, but I feel like, Alex, in this game, they had, I don't want to say as much because, again, four turnovers offensively. You cut those out, you win. But they should share some of the blame, in my opinion. And it's not a one-game sample size. Outside of Florida, you haven't been able to stop the run all season. And to me, that doesn't make sense when you look at the players you've got on that side of the ball. No, I, I agree. I mean – You got – let me put it this way, too. You got bullied in the second half at times. I mean, you got bullied up front. Oh, I, I don't even I, – I think you really just drill it down to – they get the ball back with four and a half minutes left, and they basically get six yards every single – carry and you know we even we put him in a third and no not third uh second and 14 situation and the next play they get 11 and it's it's like if you know they're going to run the ball like that's that's hard to justify like i mean listen tip of the cap to missouri's running back because to your point he's an animal but Mm. at the same time like you know what's coming like you've you've got to have some you've got to find something there to stop it and not just let them run the clock out with four and a half minutes left. Yeah. Now, so I, that I, yeah. yeah. Not whether that justifies somebody being terminated in the year, I doubt it. But that was that was like to me that was almost harder to watch than our offense was like because it's just like no matter what happens here, like we we got this life back, and you know to the defense's credit, you know they got a turnover there to get that life back. Um, but, you know, with four and a half minutes left, you've got to be able to make a stop. Hmm. Yeah, again, and I'm not calling for Jimmy Lindsay to be fired or anything like that, but it's it's just been kind of maddening, I guess, over the last couple of years. I, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I'd love to hear your take, I guess. You know, the Gamecocks, are they undersized, you think, up front defensively? Is it a lack at the linebacker no. position? Is it the lack of the linebacker position? Because I, I definitely think that's been a position that's hurt us the last couple of seasons. But something's got to change. I'm going, you know, again, offenses are hard to stop. I understand that, but the more football changes, the more it stays the same, man, that the team that can run the football and stop the run, that's normally the one that's going to get the job done. Well, for sure. And I, I don't know, and we've been talking about this all season too. I don't know that it's necessarily, yeah, I think it's a lack of depth more than anything else. I mean, I think your front line is, is fine, but you can't leave your front line in there for four straight quarters. So I think once you, you know, if you exhaust them in the early part of the game, that's just kind of where you're going to get to. Yeah, for sure. So moving off of this game, Alex, of course, like I told you, it's weird. You know, sitting here early in the week, I, I'm not as downtrodden and as upset and irate over this loss as you think one would be. I think, number one, because my expectations were set to where I wasn't shocked at what happened. But, uh, you know, you do have two great opportunities, both at home, under the lights, against Auburn and Clemson. We'll stick with this Auburn game. And, of course, the big storyline this week is the return of Mike Bobo coming back to Columbia South. Gonna all my homies hate Mike Bobo. The T-shirts have been printed. The merch is out. Be sure to go buy that, by the way. But, um, no, seriously, South Carolina Auburn, which I'm not sure if you saw this, Alex. The line opened up in this game. Auburn a 10-point favorite. As we speak here right now, that line has dropped all the way to Auburn as a six-and-a-half point favorite. So money has poured in on the Gamecocks. Bo Nix out for this game with a broken ankle. Here's another crazy storyline. The starting quarterback for Auburn, T.J. Finley, the man who lit you up last year in Baton Rouge for LSU. Not that that really means a hill of beans, but it is something interesting to talk about. When you look at this game against Auburn, um, I I think many are really excited for Clemson Week and the rivalry game and what's riding on that one. But this is a huge opportunity. And as I told you early in the show, Alex, the thing that gets me excited, this team is who it is. But coming home under the lights, Willie B should be a pretty raucous environment. You'd certainly hope so. Auburn's not world beaters either. And I think what's so intriguing, you've got a South Carolina team who's coming off a disappointing loss at Mizzou. But then you've got an Auburn team who just blew a 28-3 to lead at home to Mississippi State. So it's like, 
what are the morales of both sides like? You know what I mean? Like, when you look at this game, your overall thoughts, I mean, again, I haven't dropped any predictions or anything like that, but a six-and-a-half-point spread. You beat Auburn last year on your home field. It's an intriguing matchup, no question about it. Did the line shift before – like, was Bo Nix out when that initial line came out? I don't think it was official. I don't think it was official. So, I, I think they're definitely giving a couple of points to – the Bo Nix injury news. Yeah, I mean, from a morale standpoint, I would like to think that we're in a much, much better spot from a morale standpoint than they're going to be, especially <laughs> barely 28 to three is just a cursed score no matter who you are. <laughs> but, you know, like coming, like losing a game like that's very different than what we just lost, especially you know at home. So I would like to in, then to lose your starting quarterback to boot. So I think that from a morale standpoint, I think we're certainly in a better spot playing at home. You know, it, it it's two weird seasons that are kind of converging here. You know, obviously there's a lot of excitement to get rid of Gus Malzahn, I guess, for reasons that are beyond me. Um, but, you know, you bring in Brian Harson, you're trying to get things back rolling in Auburn. That hasn't come to fruition at all this year. So I think there's, you know, a lot of disappointment on their side where I think there's, you know, some positivity for us. Like you've kind of got your whole season in front of you here these last two weeks to get bowl eligible against opponents that are also in a reeling position. So I think that gives us a pretty nice advantage playing at home under the lights in those conditions. Yeah, it should be a fun one, man. Like I said, I, I won't spend too much time with you talking about the, the Mike Bobo storyline because that, that I think that's something more for the fans as far as like the players on the field means basically nothing. I mean, I will say, you know, one thing I'll be looking for is, you know, like I mentioned the run defense and you've been a little porous against that. Like, you know, we saw Mike Bobo last year scheme up the run game. They've got Tank Bigsby and so TJ Finley and his throwing ability is really the least of my concerns. It's can we stop Tank Bigsby on a consistent basis or at least limit him? But you mentioned a great point and I'm going to close with this. I I don't want to jump too far ahead. It's Auburn week. Looking forward to Auburn. Can't wait to be back in Willie B Saturday night. But Tell me if you relate with this, Alex, because it, it feels funny. It feels like this season is boiling down to the Carolina Clemson game. Th- this feels like one of those classic South Carolina Clemson seasons in which both schools, which has been a while since you said that, but both schools, success or failure of their season will be deemed by that one game. Like that, that, like you could beat Auburn by 50, but if you lose to Clemson, there's just a lot of fans out there that will say, well, better luck next year, better try next year. Like, I, Am I the only one that – it's just like – and I said that actually a couple of weeks ago. It's like with the season they're having, the season we're having, it's funny how it feels like the season is really just all signs are pointing towards that game. And, I mean, that's not a great thing, but I think for the health of the rivalry and Shane Moore's first year, certainly you could say that it is. Oh, for sure. Like, you know, obviously their season hasn't gone anywhere near where they expected it to go. So it's just kind of this one last piece that's sitting out there to cling to for 2021. It's it's kind of, it's weird looking back at it because, you know, for our five-year run, you know, you could make an argument after that first win, you know, the second time, the second year that we beat them, we had already clenched SEC championship. right? Right. And so, you know, it was great to get that done, but we've got something else that we're playing for there. And then, you know, you go for the three years beyond that, it's the same kind of idea. Like where you've got these three 11 win seasons in a row where you're hoping you're getting into the SEC championship. And, you know, that's obviously first and foremost for the team. And then the Clemson game becomes kind of secondary and then it reverses Mm. right after that to where, you know, now they're like certainly less concerned with our game because now they've got playoff implications they're trying to get to the national championship and obviously we've kind of run into this chasm where both of those things have evaporated and now this game i think takes a lot more importance here because of the seasons that everyone's had you know certainly disappointment for them in 21 you know more run of the mill for us where we've been for the last five years but we're in a position now to where that win is attainable that's not you're running up against some juggernaut that's number one in the country for sure and in closing out again sticking with Auburn because we're, we're going to talk plenty about Clemson next week but uh you know obviously you were on the team when the Gamecocks played Auburn and it's unfortunate man anytime someone mentions Jared Cook all they think about is the Auburn that's just that's unfair man the great career he had 
Um, but memories from taking on Auburn, I know it wasn't a, a yearly rivalry or yearly game per se, but I know while you were there, there were some very interesting games between the two schools. Yeah, that was certainly, certainly more 2006 than 2005. The, the infamous uh, Antonio Hefner double timeout game. Double timeouts um, to start the game. Yeah, that, that was that was brutal. <laughs> that was tough. That was yeah. tough. Um, but, you know, 2006, you know, it, it, like – it's funny to look back on that season now, so far past it, which is kind of mind bending. That was 15 years ago, but you know, is what it is. You know, like how close we were to you know because we lose to them by a touchdown, lost to Arkansas by a touchdown, uh, lost to Florida on a blocked field goal as time expires. Like we were, you, you were almost like right there in year two with Spurrier. And, you know, certainly that game, you know, that was the infamous game where, you know, we, we ended up losing on that Thursday night and, you know, the fans clapped for everybody as we exited the field, which Coach Spurrier had a, a little bit of an issue with in the postgame presser. Uh, I think specifically is we don't clap for losers, I think is what he said. I could be wrong on that um, or something of that, that nature. But, you know, I, I think, you know, certainly from that point forward, you know, the programs have been – you know, at least on the field, very similar, and that where the outcomes outside of the SEC championship game, you know, have been pretty, pretty close one way or the other. So I think it's just a, I think it's a team we've got a, a, a small familiarity with. And I think, you know, based on where their 21 season has gone versus where our 21 season has gone, I kind of, I, I really do like our chances in this spot, especially with the Bonex injury. You're starting a new quarterback. You know, you just had a devastating loss at home to Mississippi State, fighting Mike Leach's. And, you know, I think we're in a pretty good spot to attain bowl eligibility here. Yep, six and four against five and five. And again, like we mentioned, man, maybe this season hasn't gone quite the way some would have hoped, but you really could not ask for it to line up any better in these last two games at night under the lights at home at Willie B taking on a pair of Tigers. I mean, what, what more could you ask for? Again, Alex, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Obviously, we'll do it again the same time next week. And uh, let's hope we're talking – the Monday after a W. How about it? How about it? Let, go go back we, to what we, we were doing. Some... Yeah, go back to what we we're doing last uh, this time uh, last week. Talking talking after a a W. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but maybe the lesson in all this, Alex, is for fans, it's just a bad idea to overreact one way or the other after a win or loss. Maybe a hundred percent. I mean, listen, guys, <laughs> it could be worse. Could have lost it. Could have lost to Mississippi State. Of could have could have lost to Kansas. Could have lost to Kansas at home. As, as thirty point home favorites <laughs> blow a game to the Jayhawks. Uh, you know, like there's turmoil all over the place. Washington just fired their coach. Like you know what? We're it's it hasn't gone. I think the way that any of us expected it to go. But you can't ask for anything more than the opportunity, and we've got the opportunity in front of us the last two weeks to meet the goals that were set out in front of the season. So just go get it. Yeah. And as you say that as well, again, I will say two things. Number one, South Carolina is exactly where I picked them to be record-wise at this point in the season at five and five. Second thing, you speak of turmoil, you speak of coaches being fired. I totally forgot to mention this, and I don't know how. We are speaking exactly one year to the date, exactly one year to the date, when Will Muschamp was terminated his position. So, hey. Happy one year, my man. <laughs> Happy one year. I wonder why I woke up in such a good mood this morning. I had to admit it. <laughs> That's it. That's a great place to close it. Alex, again, always a pleasure, my friend. We'll do it again this time next week for sure. Sounds good, buddy. He's Alex McGrath. I'm Chris Phillips. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you next time on an episode of the Spurs Up Show.